Billy Edge, uh, Director of Renewable Ocean Energy here at the Coastal Studies Institute. And I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth in the series of Science on the Sound. I think it's a great tribute to the local people and the people who are able to tune in to learn more about the science from the people who are actually doing it right here in Manio. Our speaker this evening is Dr. <coughs> Lindsay Dubbs. Dr. Lindsay Dubbs has a degree, a PhD in environmental science and engineering from the University of Chapel Hill. And we're very pleased that she's here with us to tell us some about the research that she's doing in renewable ocean energy and what it means to the state of North Carolina and our citizens here. So with that, Dr. Lindsay Dubbs. Thank, thank you, you Lindsay. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone who is able to make it this evening and thank you for those who are tuning into the live stream. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. So my plan for this evening is to first explain what I mean by renewable ocean energy and then I'm going to touch upon um, the global ocean energy resources, renewable ocean energy resources. Um, and how we might be able to meet some of our energy demands with those resources. And then I'm going to tell you more about the Renewable Ocean Energy Program for North Carolina. And this program is really a lot of different researchers conducting interdisciplinary research. So I just want to clarify right, right from the start that this is not all my research. <laughs> so first, renewable energy is available in the waters of the Earth's oceans in a few different forms. And those are listed here. Um, first, there's marine hydrokinetic energy. So marine hydrokinetic energy is the energy in, the, um, in ocean water movements. This includes water movements associated with waves, tidal currents, and ocean currents. And they can be, th that energy can be harnessed by a suite of different devices. Another form of marine hydrokinetic energy that I've kind of differentiated here takes advantage of the temperature differences between the warm surface waters of the ocean that are heated by the sun's energy and cold deep waters. And the technology that harnesses this form of energy is called ocean thermal energy conversion or OTEC. There's also energy available available in the salinity concentration differences between saline ocean water and freshwater draining from land. And salinity gradient technologies harness, harness osmotic forces as the salinity um, concentration difference between the two water masses equilibrates. So I'm mostly going to be focusing my talk on this first group here, the uh, marine hydrokinetic energy in the movement of waves and tidal and ocean currents, because that is what the Renewable Ocean Energy Program for North Carolina is focusing on. Although there is some possibility that we might um, also shift some focus to offshore wind in the near future. <coughs> As I said, there are a suite of different types of technologies that can harness um, the, the energy available in the movement of ocean waters. But, but because there are so many quickly evolving um, technologies out there, they've been divided into classes. So the classes here you see are those uh, designated by the European Marine Energy Center. And as you can see, each of these Different types of classes moves in relation to water, the water movement in waves in different ways. While the devices within these different classes are evolving quickly, the classes themselves are also evolving very quickly. For instance, these last two classes, the bulge and rotating mass energy converters, are new classes that have just been added this past year. In each one of these classes, there are prototypes of the energy devices being tested either with models or in laboratories worldwide. And the first six classes are actually producing energy for the grid somewhere in the world. 
Current energy devices similarly move um, in all different ways in relation to tidal and ocean currents. You may notice that a couple of these current energy devices look a lot like wind turbines. Um, again, there are several different devices in each one of these device classes. For instance, the horizontal axis turbines can be set up in this way as pictured where it's kind of a series of turbines along a gate. Or there's another um, setup called an ecopod where, or an evopod where the horizontal axis turbine is actually on a buoy, on a single buoy. And just to provide a little bit of a reference for scale, now you know how these devices move in relation to water movements, but as far as scale, this is a ocean power technology power buoy, or OPT power buoy. And you can see here some people getting the device ready for deployment, um, and then the device installed in the water. Um, so this buoy is now uh, perpendicular to its orientation in the first picture. These OPT power buoys are already installed in Scotland, England, and off the coast of Oregon. So why are we even interested in renewable ocean energy in the first place? Why should we pursue this? Um, the first reason is that there's a substantial resource out there. Hopefully you've all witnessed firsthand the energy available in the oceans, you've felt waves crash onto you on the shore, you felt the sand and water um, pull or recede back to the ocean. Um, you've also, in some cases, probably felt uh, the tides going through Oregon Inlet, take your boat or your kayak, I guess most people don't kayak through Oregon Inlet, but <laughs> take your boat through Oregon Inlet faster than it could go itself, or with the motor itself. But the um, energy available in the Earth's oceans has also been quantified on a global scale. And it's really kind of a coarse estimate. In these two figures, you can see wave power and tidal range power across the world's oceans. And the warmer colors mean that there is more um, energy available. Um, and down here, you can see this is the global electricity demand in 2011, and then the theoretical resources for waves, tidal range, and um, ocean currents. You can see that there's a lot of energy available out there, and definitely enough to surpass our demand. Um, but it's really important to be practical and keep in mind that all, not all of that energy can actually be harnessed. Um, these devices that I showed you are not 100% efficient, so a lot of them, in the best case scenario, can harness about 30% of the available energy. Also, you may notice that some of these resources are in really deep waters, and so it's not technologically possible right now to put devices in those deep waters. Also, there are already people and other organisms that are using the ocean environment, and so we can't just cover the whole ocean with uh, point absorbers and attenuators. Nonetheless, um, renewable ocean energy is, can really supply um, a substantial amount of power to meet our uh, energy demands. Another reason um, that we should pursue renewable ocean energy is that it makes sense to locate sources of energy near the demand for energy. Um, Part of the reason for that is that power and electricity is lost in transmission. Um, coastal areas are more often than not the locus of energy demand. In a study by McGranahan and others, they found that 10% of the world's population and 13% of the world's urban population are located um, along coastlines um, less than 10 meters above sea level, um, whereas uh, coastlines only comprise 2% of the world's land area. Another reason to pursue additional sources of energy, whether renewable or, or not, um, is that the global population is growing. So you can see that from 1999 to 2011, 
In 12 years, there, was, there were 1 billion additional people added to the world's population, and there's expected to be, to be a billion more added by 2024. Um, and so their demand for energy, the demand for energy is also increasing. You can see these are the main sources of um, electricity in the world right now, or over time. To borrow an anecdote from Thomas Friedman in Hot, Flat, and Crowded, if the next one billion people used electricity equivalent to a 60-watt light bulb for four hours, it would require 10,000 megawatts more um, electricity production, and that's equivalent to building about 17 new 600 megawatt coal-fired power plants. The, implica the implications for relying solely on non-renewable energy um, could be the topic of a whole additional talk, but I'm not really going to go into that here. Um, there are people and organizations who are working to meet this growing demand for energy all over the world. And um, with regard to renewables, in North Carolina alone, we have the North Carolina Solar Center working on it. We have NC Green Power. UNC Institute of Marine Science has really been very instrumental in studying offshore wind resources. And I'm sure there are a lot of other organizations that I'm not even aware of working on renewable energy for our state. But as I said before, here at CSI, we're focusing on marine hydrokinetic energy. So I wanted to tell you about our program. Um, this is our mission and more specifics about the program. Um, it was created by the North Carolina State Legislature and it dictates that a partnership between UNC Coastal Studies Institute, North Carolina State University, North Carolina A&T University, and UNC Charlotte be formed to conduct research to conceptualize, design, construct, operate, and market new and innovative technologies. So we can't just take an off-the-shelf technology and plop it in the ocean. We need to be innovating here with this program. Um, we're encouraged to leverage federal and private funding, and this is an interdisciplinary effort. I'm just going to allow you to um, read the mission of the program. So one of the first tasks that our program has focused on and is still focusing on is assessing the resources available off the North Carolina coast. Um, you saw the global resource maps, but as I said, they're at a very coarse resolution, so we need a finer resolution idea of the, the resources available and also their spatial extent. The first assessment that was done um, was a tidal current resource assessment conducted by Marjorie Overton at North Carolina State University and GU also at North Carolina State University. Um, Doctors Overton and Yu modeled the energy available in all of North Carolina's in inlets using a program called ADCIRC. And ADCIRC is a highly developed program for solving equations of the motion of fluids on a rotating earth. It was developed by a research team that includes um, Rick Ludick from UNC Institute of Marine Science and Brian Blayton from RENCI, or the Renaissance Computing Center. Computing Center. Um, for those who don't know, uh, tidal streams are high velocity sea currents created by the periodic movement of, o of ocean caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and sun in relation to the earth. Um, tidal current energy for that reason is really persistent and um, predictable. However, most tidal stream power Converters requ require a minimum slow flow speed of 0.5 to 1 meters per second with an ideal speed between 1.5 and 3.5 meters per second. And as you can see here, um, the, the top five most viable inlets in North Carolina, Oregon, Hatteras, Ocracoke, Masonboro, and Cape Fear River um, don't really meet that ideal flow speed requirement. And for that reason, um, we are not really pursuing tidal current energy um, for this program until technological advances maybe allow for lower flow speeds to be harnessed. 
Just rec recently, Billy Edge um, and Kevin Gamel, who's from the Renaissance Computing Center, who are both in-house here at the Coastal Studies Institute, partnered with Brian Blayton at RENCI and Jeff Hansen at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Field Research Facility in Duck to conduct a historical wave assessment for North Carolina and beyond. Um, the wave hindcast basically predicts wave conditions, height and period, um, using a computer model and observed wind fields. They calculated um, the wave height and period for all of these individual points seen here for a 20 year period and hopefully a 10 year period an additional 10 years will be calculated eventually. That data was then used to calculate power density and you can see that there is variable power density um, near shore to the North Carolina coast ranging from about 15 to 15,800 watts per square meter per year. So it's very highly spatially variable. They also found that the resource off the North Carolina coast is not nearly as substantial as off um, other US coasts like Oregon and Washington and Alaska, but North Carolina is still in a really good position to pursue wave energy because we have this large area of shallow water in which wave devices could be deployed. So it still is a resource of interest to us. The next assessment is the Gulf Stream uh, current resource assessment, and this is an ongoing assessment. Um, the animation on the left was provided by John Bain and Caroline Loucher at UNC Institute of Marine Science. Um, they show, it shows sea surface temperature off the southeast coast of the US, and a feature that I hope that you notice in this animation is this dark red color. That's the Gulf Stream. Um, and it's dark red because the sea surface temperature of the Gulf Stream is much higher than the surrounding waters. As you can see, the location of the Gulf Stream over time varies quite a bit at this particular location. And so Dr. Bain and Caroline Loucher um, interpreted data that was modeled by Royying Hay um, from NC State University to look at the temporal variability of that particular point um, over, an annual, over several years and over the course of one year. So as you can see, there is a great deal of variability at that one location. Um, and that variability is caused by the Gulf Stream's meandering, not because there's an actual decrease in the Gulf Stream's power at any point in time. So Mike Melia, um, who it works here at UNC Coastal Studies Institute and is a uh, doctoral student at UNC Institute of Marine Science, is collecting Gulf Stream current data using an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which is pictured here. And basically this ADCP is placed on the seabed and it allows um, us to record the current velocities and directions through the whole entire water column. So this information will hopefully be used to verify the models and the interpretation. Um, and Mike is also then comparing that to a long series of uh, radar data that he has about sea surface temperatures. And he's also conducting transects to kind of look at what the Gulf Stream's spatial extent is um, over a larger area, not just this one location. So far, based on the radar data and models, it does seem like the Gulf Stream resource would be a really great source of energy. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do to identify the exact location that would be um, feasible for that. Another direction of the Renewable Ocean Energy Program for North Carolina is to address challenges to renewable um, energy and to marine hydrokinetic energy specifically. The first challenge is cost. You saw the size of that device, the OPT power buoy, um, and that's probably um, one of the smaller devices. There are devices that are actually larger than that. So there are really high capital costs for constructing that device. There are really high costs for installing it. And then there are high costs for maintaining devices. 
um, especially in the harsh ocean environment. These costs mean that the price for renewable energy in general, and especially for marine hydrokinetic energy, are not cost competitive with non-renewables. And you can kind of get a sense, sense of the range of costs from this figure here on the top. Um, the non-renewable energy costs are this orange bar, and you can see that they extend from about three to 10 cents um, per kilowatt hour. Um, the, the maximum cost of all of the renewables far exceeds the cost um, of non-renewables. And for ocean energy, um, even the minimum exceeds the cost of the non-renewables. Another challenge is that many forms of um, renewable energy, especially wind and wave energy, are very intermittent. There's a lot of variation. And this bottom figure illustrates that. So this shows wave height and wave power density over time for a particular location. Um, and as you can see, there is a lot of variability. That's a problem when you're trying to have a consistent source of energy. Two other challenges are just limitations in knowledge. One of them is understanding of coastal processes and forces for device development and testing. And the other one is information regarding the potential conflicts, synergies, and viability of marine hydrokinetic energy and other renewables. The Renewable Ocean Energy Program researchers are attempting to address or at least contribute to um, solving some of these challenges or yeah, helping to solve these challenges um, in a variety of different ways. And I'm now going to tell you a little bit about each of these different um, research directions, magnetic geared power takeoff, ocean compressed air energy storage, smooth particle hydrodynamic modeling, a wave energy test center, and some assessments related to the environment, public policy, and economics. The first research direction that I want to focus on is power takeoff. So one thing that is in common between all forms of marine hydrokinetic energy and also wind energy um, is that they need to capture kinetic energy and turn it into work. And so that's what a power takeoff system is for. Here is an example of how a system typically works. The low speed unidirectional motion of the energy device, whether it be, again, wave, wind, or current energy, needs to be sped up to drive an electric generator in the end. And so that can be done um, in a variety of different ways. One of them is gearboxes, and that's kind of the situation here. Excuse me. Um, and that's what's used in the majority of existing wind turbines right now. Um, we've, or we already have experience that shows that that is a, um, not a very reliable type of power takeoff system, um, and that it could be worse in the marine environment. Also, the maintenance of these types of power takeoff systems are difficult and costly. The other two options are direct drive generators, and those are better options. Um, but both of those options traditionally use a large quantity of rare earth magnets. Um, the problem with rare earth magnets is, as the name implies, they're rare, and they are used in a lot of different technologies. They're used in your cell phones, they're used in computers, they're used by the military in large quantities, um, and now they're being used in renewable energy as well. So the demand is consistently growing and most of the mining and processing of those rare earth magnets is done in China. And China has a huge demand for a lot of those technologies. So, so they're kind of holding on to the rare earth magnets more and more. And um, we don't really have another source for them. Um, and it will take a long time for the US to start mining and processing rare earth magnets itself. Um, the last company that did mine for rare earth magnets in the US uh, stopped mining for them because of the environmental considerations. Um, mining causes really acidic uh, wastewater, radioactive wastewater, and air emissions. So the solution 
offered by a research team with the Ocean Energy Program from UNC Charlotte and North Carolina State University, came up with this solution, magnetic gearing using ferrite magnets. So ferrite magnets, well ferrite is a lot, a much more abundant material, and that means that the cost of the ferrite is much lower. The problem with ferrite is that it doesn't have um, as strong a field strength, so it's not as magnetic. So this team has come up with this unique topology, or a topology similar to this, um, which is basically just the geometry of the layout of the magnets to help improve that flux density. So um, this power takeoff system um, basically provides that direct drive without the rare earth magnets. So how does this address challenges? I already said it's a lower cost, more environmentally benign, um, and it's also more efficient and reliable than its counterpart, which again translates to lower costs. So that means that there's potential for increasing cost competitiveness of wind, wave, and current energy. As I said before, another challenge is using intermittent energy sources to provide a consistent base load of power. So base load power is the power required to meet the minimal demands of customers. Um, and so in this particular example, I'm sorry, it's not very pretty, but um, you can see this is the blue line is the daily wave power generated and the daily electricity demand is in red. So both are very variable. Um, and the way that uh, baseload power can be supplied with that intermittent resource is by storage. So at periods of time where the wave power, sorry, the wave energy, wave power harnessed, um, it exceeds the daily electricity demand, that, that um, energy can be stored and then pulled upon at a time when demand exceeds the, um, the power generated by the devices. And this one, of, one option for storing this is compressed air energy storage, or O case, or sorry, case, no O in it yet. Um, case on land is currently being used by sever several power utilities and basically they use caverns left behind when miners finish mining and clearing salt domes. And essentially what happens is the air is sent into, is pressurized into these salt caverns. And when there's an excess of, of power being generated, and then at times when that power is needed, it can be released and um, be released through a turbine that then again, generates power. Uh, all the, one of the issues with this case storage system is that it requires very large areas to store that air, um, and there's also a, a risk of blowouts. So the solution that a team from North Carolina State University and UNC Charlotte came up with is ocean compressed air energy storage or that they're investigating, I should say. It didn't come up with necessarily, but um, basically in an OK system, it's a little bit different than the K system because um, the air that's being stored is being stored underwater. So you can make use of the hydrostatic pressure. Um, and for that reason, you don't need as large a volume for the storage, and you also don't run the risk of blowouts as much. So OCASE has the potential to sol sol solve a challenge of renewable energy by, first of all, improving upon CASE technologies um, by utilizing that hydrostatic pressure available underwater. Um, and also, it can solve the intermittency problems associated with many forms of uh, renewable energy, thereby providing baseload power. So a challenge specific to marine hydrokinetic energy is that um, water movements in the ocean are highly complex and dynamic, and they operate at a very fine spatial scale. And so 
a solution to this was to model at the scale of water particles um, to better computational design tools for marine hydrokinetic energy. And this um, research effort has been led by Billy Edge, Carol, Robert Darimble, and Kevin Gamble. Um, but it's also been, um, it's really interesting to watch this research progress because it's always um, a big group of students that come from all over the world here for workshops the last two years. So that's been fun to have them in house here to, um, to solve this problem. And just to give you an idea of what this animation is showing, it's showing a surge converter. If you remember that type of device that operates like this um, in a wave field and these two different surge converters have different buoyancies. And so it's a way to optimize the design of the device to capture, harness the optimal amount or the maximum amount of energy. Another challenge with regard to limited understanding of the complexity of the ocean environment and how harsh it can be when actually um, deploying structures into it is that there are very few places for devices to be tested in the US. There are several places for devices to be tested in Europe, but not in the US. Um, and that testing is really essential to not only optimize devices to harness as much energy as possible, um, but also to be able to address some of the issues that is presented by the harsh environment in the ocean and assess interactions with the environment, ecology, and human uses. Um, a solution offered by the Renewable Energy Program in partnership with Jeanette's Pier in the town of Nags Head is to offer a shallow water research platform at, off of Jeanette's Pier. And um, so far we've already had one successful deployment. So I'm gonna show you a video that John McCord did um, that shows a our first deployment of a device that was conducted in 2011. The UNC Coastal Studies Institute, in partnership with Resolute Marine Energy and Jeanette's Pier, recently conducted a field test of a wave energy conversion device in the waters just off the end of the pier. My name is Cliff Gowdy and I'm here uh, working with Resolute Marine Energy. Uh, we're out on Jeanette's Pier uh, and hopefully today uh, or soon thereafter we'll be getting this device in the water and we'll begin our experiments measuring wave power. Uh, behind me is a, a, a wave energy converter and there's many different types. This one is a surge type uh, device that uh, captures the energy from the surge motion of waves going back and forth in shallow water. And this device captures that energy and turns it into power. What we're seeing is uh, uh, fairly high efficiencies, well above uh, being able to capture 50% of the energy that's coming, coming by. And depending upon the shoreline, uh, where you're at and what the conditions are, you know, the average wave energy, maybe 10 kilowatts per meter of shoreline. So if you do the math, you can see there's a quite a bit of energy. If you, even if you can capture just half of that, you have quite a bit of energy if you can put a row of these along a the shoreline. Um, expressed by additional renewable energy um, companies to test off of Jeanette's Pier. Um, there are plans to put a demonstration OCase system underneath Jeanette's Pier this spring. 
and we have applied for permits for two um, additional test bursts that are outside of the um, shadow of the pier, uh, footprint of the pier, um, both offshore and alongshore. Uh, the Jeanette's Pier platform has also been really useful for testing instrumentation um, and collecting data, and that's been really important for overall understanding of the marine environment, the local marine environment. For marine hydrokinetic energy to be successful in the long run, we, ne we need to know how it might interact with the environment and ecology and existing uses of the coastal ocean um, so that any conflicts can be minimized and any synergies can be maximized. We also need to carefully site installations to avoid ecologically sensitive and culturally and recre recreationally important areas. Um, and so the uh, next project was environmental and stakeholder assessment. And um, basically we were first identifying the potential conflicts and synergies in the coastal ocean and then ex uh, examining the spatial extent of those potential conflicts. And this was a research team that many of these people um, worked on the, a similar assessment for wind energy offshore of North Carolina, so they were great resources to have. Um, but the, the conflicts and synergies are a little bit different with marine hydrokinetic versus wind energy. Um, so you can see this is one of the maps that was produced from that study, these are areas important to the life histories of fishes, coastal birds, and seabirds, sea turtles, and marine mammals. And you can see there are a lot of areas that are important to those different organisms. So really, that doesn't mean that we can't necessarily put devices in those areas and explore um, harnessing energy from those areas. It just means that we need to be sensitive and make sure that we understand what all of the risks might be and weigh them against the risks of other forms of energy. So um, the specific and special considerations that we identified um, and assessed the risks posed to are mostly shown here. So marine mammals are one of those, especially right whales. Right whales um, pass by the North Carolina coast and there are only approximately 300 of them um, living. Um, and as those of us who live in the area know, commercial and recreational fisheries um, are an important economic and cultural part of this community. Um, endangered species such as sea turtles and Atlantic sturgeon need to be considered. And important habitat areas like hard bottom and sargassum. This is a picture that John took actually in uh, water just off of Moorhead City um, of a coral reef system. Uh, and also I should mention cultural resources like shipwrecks are another really important um, thing that we need to consider and avoid when we're citing devices. So because marine hydrokinetic energy is a nascent industry, we know very little about how it might interact, how the devices might interact with the environment, or how it will affect different environmental processes. So we're partnering um, with some other projects to try and determine how those particular projects will affect the marine environment, ecology, and the, the uh, human use conflicts are kind of a different story um, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so for the Gulf Stream Energy Project, the one thing that we're doing with that project is coordinating and communicating for siting purposes. So we don't want to be taking all of our data from a place that is within a protected area or right on top of a shipwreck. Um, we're also beginning to monitor marine mammal abundance and distribution with hydrophones that will be installed um, very close by to where the ADCP is located. Um, we're also monitoring sargassum distribution. So sargassum is pictured right up here. It's a macroalgae. Um, that is carried in the Gulf Stream current. Sometimes we find it washed up on the beaches here. 
Um, but it's really important to um, productivity and nutrient cycling in the Gulf Stream and the open ocean. And it's also an important fish community or the habitat for uh, a fish community that's protected. Um, so we're monitoring that distribution in associated communities. And then we are beginning an experiment to look at how changes in hydrodynamics, perhaps introduced by Gulf Stream turbines, will affect the, product, the processes, the nutrient cycling happening in those sargassum communities. Um, another project is in partnership with the OCASE project. And um, an intern from the field site, Laura Zdansky, is helping in part with this project, she, we are building um, colonization plates and looking at what types of critters are going to grow on those plates, on any type of surface that we put into the marine environment. There are potential for synergies with that because colonization means that you are creating more habitat. And so what types of materials might maximize that habitat creation? That's what we're interested in. Um, in partnership with the OCASE project and all other projects that um, will be demonstrated at the Wave Energy Test Center, we're going to be monitoring the sound emissions from those devices. We will be monitoring colonization of their surfaces and um, also how they change sediment dynamics. Another important question to consider is how viable is marine hydrokinetic in North Carolina. Um, and one of the ways to address that is economic analysis because economics and costs are so important to the viability of different types of energy. Um, this an analysis has allowed um, researchers working with Andrew Keeler and J Joe DeCarolis um, to construct a flexible cost model that allows anyone to examine um, how cost changes with different variables. And the variables are listed here. It's not just the ocean resource, but also the scale and scope of the installation, how long it can be kept in place, policies, and also um, these costs that are uh, more well-defined, ca well, capital and operational costs, not necessarily maintenance costs. Um, they basically have concluded that improvements in uh, several areas will be necessary to make marine hydrokinetic um, competitive with wind and solar technologies. But then to improve upon the viability, um, that we felt that it was also necessary to look at public policy and to involve stakeholders. So the analysis outcomes of the public policy analysis um, were that Basically, all of the policies are based on the oil and gas industry and the risks associated with oil and gas exploration versus marine hydrokinetic are far greater, but those associated with marine hydrokinetic are far less known. And so that poses a problem as far as permitting and public policy. Marine hydrokinetic is usually a smaller scale with smaller risks, um, but permitting and um, finding policy to support marine hydrokinetic energy uh, is difficult because of the novelty of the devices. However, we feel that there are significant environmental benefits that offset the risks, and that's primarily because of all of the externalities of fossil fuel-based energy. Um, and again, that's not something that I'm going to go into detail about here. So as far as next steps related to improving upon viability, in addition to technological advances in engineering, um, another, another um, step is to engage stakeholders. Uh, and that means communities and individuals whose li livelihoods and rec recreation could potentially be affected by the installation of marine hydrokinetic energy devices. And so this is, um, in this study, an outreach effort, we hope to learn about people's concerns and also learn from people about um, specialized local knowledge related to where conflicts might occur, things like that. So I've basically outlined our entire program for you. I hope that you have some um, questions. I know that I covered a lot of diverse uh, 
disciplines in there. And um, I'm not an engineer, so if you have really technical questions, I can try and find you an answer to them. But otherwise, I'll do my best to answer general questions. And thanks for listening. <laughs>
A renewable energy portfolio standard basically says that within a, a certain period of time, a certain portion of the energy supply or energy demand needs to be met with renewable energy sources. Yes, the, um, the, the wave action uh, unit that you had off of Jeanette's pier, mm -hmm. uh, did that produce energy? And like, was it tied into anything in Jeanette's pier where it's actually producing, or was it just like a? It was basically burning off the energy. So, um, but it was being measured, and it was producing energy. It just wasn't feeding into the grid. And there are a number of reasons for that. Hopefully, some of the test centers within the US are going to have the capability to feed into the grid. But when you, um, put, when you feed electricity into the grid, there's a whole other series of permits that is required. That's one of the reasons why. Um, unless you have the capability to test a lot of different devices, it doesn't, it's not enough power that's being generated that makes sense to pursue that type of permit. Well, that, that same unit, uh, I mean, were the test results favorable for bigger units or, I mean? Yeah, that company is putting in a large um, installation off of Alaska. And they also tested a second iteration of their device off of the Army Corps of Engineers field research pier. So they're moving ahead, they're doing well. Wow, so the, the, the results they got from the tests here, mm -hmm. they're going on to a larger scale? Yes. Do they have any plans for any larger units here? Or, or? Not presently. The, the wave resource off of Alaska is a lot greater than it is here. And so um, it's still, I, I feel, a way to move towards having those types of devices here because as you have more devices in place and um, you can prove that they're generating um, electricity, that they're generating power, and you can improve upon the design, then it makes it more and more possible for lower energy sites to also have devices installed at them. Just out of curiosity, were you all also looking at like the everything you talked, were you all studying like how it affected the marine environment? Was it chopping up turtles, you know? And uh, like <laughs> well, um, we, with that device, so we weren't monitoring environmental variables with that device, but the places where the devices, where the environmental interactions have been monitored, um, I haven't seen, most of the studies show that Actually, all of the studies show that they are not chopping up fish or turtles. Um, they are not even producing so much shear stress on really small organisms that it's hurting those organisms. Um, everything that I've seen so far shows that these devices, all the studies that have come out so far shows that these devices are relatively environmentally benign, although there are not that many studies out there yet. You may have already said this, and I apologize, but um, are there any um, countries in the world that are producing power with these devices that are contributing to the grid? Yes, there are a lot of European countries. Um, Scotland is really taking the lead. They have a lot of policies in place that are basically building their marine hydrokinetic energy industry up really quickly, and I think they have plans to have something like 60 to 80, per I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact number, but 60 to 80 percent of their um, energy demands be met by marine hydrokinetic resources in the next 10 years and are, are or something. Are visiting um, professionals from Scotland um, come over here as consultants? Or? Um, well, they're at all of the meetings. Um, always giving presentations at meetings. They're always willing to talk to people here. I mean, I've found everyone that I've talked to to be really open and helpful and wanting to collaborate. So, um, yeah, I'm sure they would consult. <laughs> you might add that we had a, con a consultant for us oh. from England, uh, from the lab there in Scotland. Oh, okay, from EMAC. Thank you. you mentioned the uh, storage unit that was, I do believe you said, compressed air. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I mean, I know that it's a big deal to be able to put energy in a fluctuating power source because it has big ramifications on the grid. Yes. Where do you guys sit in the mix in terms of that being a solution? Are there other people working with similar types of solution solutions? And how far along are you in terms of making that a viable solution? Because that's, you know, that's a big deal if, if you guys nail it. Yep, it is a big deal. And um, I am not part of that research team, so I don't know exactly where they are. Billy might have, Billy gets the um, quarterly report, so he might know better than I do. But um, there are other teams that are working on similar research, um, but it seems like our team, from what I know, is moving ahead, that some of the other teams address some problems that our team foresaw prior to those problems arising. Am I right about that, Billy? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll add okay. to that. ABB is interested in this and some other people. They have some systems that they would like to, they're advertising that they can solve your problems. They're not in the ocean either yet. Uh, the Navy is very interested in this problem. There is really no one out there. The Navy put out a contract and had someone study uh, a location off of, the Cal uh, off of Hawaii to see just how suitable it would be, whether or not it would work well. But they'd never come back to the next step to say, okay, let's go forward. So we, are, we our research team, is working with some other people to help uh, design and potentially construct and test those devices that would be underwater that would basically be filled with compressed air and then be able to use that to move ashore. We have built some devices in the <coughs> laboratory at NC State that actually simulate this whole process of taking energy from some device, whether it's waves or wind, compressing that, compressing air with that energy, or converting it into compressed air, driving it into a pressure cylinder, and then releasing that to drive a turbine to generate electricity. So it's, it's like all of these, they're, they're complicated processes that takes a long bit of time and money in order to be able to come up with a solution that really works well. Now, could I ask my question? Dr. Dubs, tell yes. us what really excites you about this field that you're working in. Okay. Um, I am thrilled to be involved um, with ocean renewable energy, renewable energy in general, especially ocean-based energy, um, because first of all, it's a nascent field, and second of all, because I did my dissertation work on um, greenhouse gases, the feedback between two different greenhouse gas gases and how carbon dioxide affects methane concentrations. Um, so I think in the environmental science field, a lot of times we are constantly measuring the problems. We are constantly measuring what's wrong. So it's really exciting to be um, involved in research that is addressing some of those problems. Um, and I really feel that this is one of those fields. It's also exciting to be able to do research that hopefully will help to um, head off any sort of conflicts, any sort of environmental detriments before they happen, because it is a nascent um, sector. We have time for a few more questions before we uh, oh, do you that one? Okay. get to our conclusion. <laughs> How much uh, of the work do you anticipate being in federal waters or state waters that you're looking at? It seems like the majority <coughs> of your stuff um, is in state waters and maybe get more bang for the buck in, in some federal waters. Just the, the, the depth, depth of the waters and stuff. I just wonder what percentage are you looking at federal and what state? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we know yet. I think we're just looking at, sorry, Nancy. Oh, okay. Um, so Dewey asked the percentage of the work that we anticipate to be um, being done in state water waters versus federal waters. And so right now, I think that we're really just looking at all of the waters off the North Carolina coast. Technological, um, uh, there, there isn't necessarily the technology for foundations in very deep waters, and so um, foundations and moorings 
And so we are probably looking at things um, on the shelf, perhaps on the shelf slope, but then you have issues with slumping and landslides and things like that. So um, yeah, there's probably, so I can't give you an exact percentage, but some work that's being pursued in state waters and some in federal waters. Right now, the test center is all in state waters. We have another question back here. Yes. Um, this is for Dr. Edge. Would you explain to me about the patent system? I mean, if one of these students invents something, who gets credit for it? Do you just give it away to these companies? Well, that's a very interesting question and one that we have uh, tried to follow the courses so that as our researchers, their students, are developing devices and techniques and processes, we have a, an agreement uh, that we require the different universities to sign that also is signed by the people we work with outside, the de device developers and others so that there is an understanding of who owns the intellectual property. They might go out and build the widget, but if we own the intellectual property for that widget, then we shall reap in part of that benefit. So hopefully as, as this process matures, we'll have the opportunity to reap some benefits from the investment that the state's made in this program. Billy, you might have a comment about the economic development part of the legislation so that they understand that part of it is to tie into North Carolina businesses. Uh, very early on in the, in the presentation that Dr. Dubbs gave, she <coughs> showed the mission statement. She asked us all to read that. The mission is that we are in the process of doing this to contribute to not only the development of economics in the, in the coastal environment or this part of the state, but also <coughs> to help in the creation of job opportunities. So those are two major foci, foci that we have tried to keep ourselves focused on for the last four years that we've been in this program. Jobs in the economy. So that's where we started, that's where we're working, and that's where ultimately we're going to survive and win. We're looking forward to it. So since our time is up, uh, our people are dialing off that have tiled in to listen to what you've had a chance to listen to. I'd like to, on behalf of you, and those people that might be out there listening to us on the internet, thank Dr. Dubs for a very nice presentation. It's very informative, and we appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you.